Hi everyone, hope you're doing well. Welcome back to Frankie Sense and More for another exciting episode of Movies with Meaning. I am Ishita, your guest host, and of course we have here with us our one and only in-house movie correspondent, Brent Marchand. Brent Hi, is a long time... <laughs> Hi, sorry to cut you off, Brent. <laughs> Brent is a longtime film fan and the author of three books. Check out, a, check out the fantastic movie reviews on his blog if you're looking for something new to watch by going over to www.brentmarchand.com. Without further ado, let's get into the episode. Great. Well, uh, to start off this, this, uh, this episode, we have three movies that address issues related to the health and well-being of the planet and society and man's role in them. Um, they might be a little bit of a downer. I don't mean to be, you know, <laughs> kind of give us a sour start to yeah. show the show. Uh, but these are things that are out right now. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to cover them. And these three sort of go together in their own kind of interesting way. Uh, the first one is the movie of the summer so far, which is Jurassic World Dominion. This is the latest installment in the long-running franchise that's been going on for almost 30 years now. And this is the sixth film and the third film in the current trilogy. And it's been said to be the finale. Personally, I'm not buying that. This is too much of a moneymaker for the distributors yeah. for them to walk away from it. So you might go away for a while, but I doubt seriously that this is the end. So basically, this is a, a film that it is a rather complicated plot involving uh, four story threads that all sort of start out separately and eventually come together. And it's a, probably a little too long to go into what all of them are exactly. But basically, this is one of those films that's a big blockbuster action adventure, summertime popcorn movie that people go to to see great special effects and things blowing up and, right. you, know, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And at that point, this film definitely does not disappoint. It definitely, you know, comes through and delivers the goods on that score. Uh, and also, it's true to the theme that has been running through all of these films, which has been addressing the question of the dangers of genetic engineering, and even more fundamentally, the question of personal responsibility, the idea of just because you can do something, does that mean that you should? Uh, this is it's a, a really a, a significant theme that could be applied not just in this particular area of genetic engineering, but in many areas of life these days. So it becomes somewhat allegorical in that regard. Right. Uh, this film combines the cast members from the current trilogy of films and also brings back the cast members from the, the original Jurassic Park movie from 1993. So you have really this you know, blockbuster power cast that's, you know, telling this story. Yeah. And uh, it, it's probably the last time you'll see the people from the original movies appearing on screen. I can't say that for sure, but that's my guess. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they mesh well with the, with the stars who are in the current film. So you really have a, an interesting mix of uh, lighter moments as well as all the big action adventure, stellar special effects moments as well. Uh, this is a film that it, it's not without its issues. It's, it goes on a little bit long and some of the character development's a little monodimensional at times. Uh, some of the messages that it's delivering are given in a little bit of a heavy handed way at points. But it's a film that's been really trounced by a lot of critics and personally i didn't think it was as bad as they've made it out to be uh, you know it, it's 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 not epic filmmaking it's not something that's going to go down in the annals of film history or anything like that but it's moderately entertaining a good movie for the summer mm -hmm. uh, there's a certain familiarity you know with the characters that you've seen before so right. you get kind of a, a comfort factor for the viewer they, they have some expectations about what they're going to see going in, and those are fulfilled. So this is a movie that really, it's, it's fun. 
Um, not perfect, but definitely enjoyable and makes its point and does so in a way that's visually stunning, uh, fun to look at. Mm -hmm. So I'd recommend it if you, uh, especially if you are a fan of the series, uh, the, uh, the, the dinosaurs, the way they're depicted here, it's just, you know, it's just stunning in terms of the way they're, the special effects carry out. So uh, if you like the action adventure, uh, genre and you want to see something that's in theaters that's good mm -hmm. to look at on a big screen by all means go see it so what are some things that critics say that are bad about this film is there anything specific they've been criticizing it in terms of thinking it's rather lame compared to some of the uh -huh. previous installments uh, -huh. uh they said they feel that the the, the different story threads that come together feel a little forced in the way that they eventually tie together. That's not entirely a bad criticism. There, there is a little bit of that that certainly comes into to play with this film. But, you know, so many times I see movies these days, you know, critics just really overhyping their responses to them. Mm -hmm. You know, the the claims of, Oh, this is this is the worst movie ever. Or, I mean, okay. I mean, yes. Sometimes you actually do see the worst movie ever. I certainly don't feel that this is it. Yeah. You know. So yes, it, it's easy to kind of overplay the reaction, and I certainly don't feel that what you've got here is deserving of it. I mean, if you compare this, for example, to the first movie in the current trilogy, Jurassic World which came out in 2015, yes, that was pretty laughable. I mean, it, that, that really was worthy of, of all the criticisms that were labeled, leveled against it. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's as fair a comparison this time out with this one. Uh, the director who made that one also made this one, and I can see where he has definitely stepped up his game. <laughs> right. Time. You know, yeah. So he's made improvements, and that's good to see. You know, it shows yeah. growing the filmmaker. Um, he's still got some things to learn, I think, but you know, a better job overall this time. So, so with that being said, how much would you rate this film? I would give this one three stars. That's pretty decent. You know, I mean, that's not awful. It's not great, yeah. but it's not awful either. So yeah, just a fun watch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Brent. Uh, let's move on to the next film for today. Okay, so the next of the, uh, the, the World Horrors Trilogy <laughs> is a film, <laughs> it's a film from Italy called Mondo Cane. And this was inspired by another Italian film of the same name that was made in the early 60s. This one is a narrative feature. That one was a documentary. Uh, basically, this is a story about a dystopian future, sort of like what you see in films like the Mad Max films uh, or the, uh, the Blade Runner films. Mm -hmm. Essentially, this is a, a world that's beset by so many problems. It's got rampant crime, environmental problems, um, great disparity in terms of inequality, Police, uh, police brutality and authoritarianism. And it follows the story of two young teenage guys who are friends and trying to survive under this, these circumstances. Uh, they scramble to make ends meet and to, to stay alive. In many ways, um, they end up uh, looking for people who are going to try to bail them out. And one of them ends up becoming involved with a gang leader who is somewhat akin to the character Fagan from Oliver Twist, the, the, uh, the criminal who recruits young people to do his right. dirty work for him, you know. And they both end up getting drawn into his schemes of carrying out various different kinds of crimes. And they, they, they struggle to get by. Eventually, as things play out, it starts to affect their friendship because uh, they're kind of going in different directions with how they want to respond to all this. Uh, the film is 
you know, it's been called a film that's representative of the near future, but in many ways, you know, given the problems that they're talking about here, a lot of them already exist. So it, in, that, in that sense, it's not really that much of a stretch to say that this is something really out of bounds from what we're used to. Yeah. Um, so basically, it's, it's a story of survival. It's a story of friendship and the strains that can be put upon it as they struggle to get by in this dangerous new world. Uh, one of the things I did like about it is the fact that these are story themes that have been typically relegated primarily to American films. You don't necessarily see a lot of these kinds of stories coming out of other countries. Right. This one, <clears throat> excuse me, this one did come out of Italy and right. they did a decent job with it. Uh, the, the, there are some problems with the script. It does meander a bit at times and it does, um, it comes across a little bit episodic in terms of the way the story is told. A uh, few threads are kind of left not fully resolved as well yeah. as they could have been. But again, if, if this is your cup of tea, if you enjoy things like the Mad Max movies and Blade Runner, I think you'll probably like this one as well. Uh, it's a, uh, it's got some, it does have some rather graphic imagery in it. So sensitive viewers may want to, you know, consider how seriously they want to look at this one. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, there are certainly some cautionary tales and important lessons coming out of this, I think, that are important in terms of addressing what we need for, you know, humanity to survive. How far are we going to let things go? Uh, and this, this puts those questions under a very bright spotlight. So. Wow. Well, uh, how much would you give this one? Uh, I would give this one three stars as well. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, I want to, to uh, just remind viewers that uh, Mondo Cane, which translates to dog world in Italian. Oh. Um, Mondo Cane if they're going to go look to rent it, because it is stream available for streaming online, they want to see it, make sure they look for the current version, not to be confused with the 1963 film by the same oh. name, which again is more of a documentary, although okay. it delves with the same subject matter mm -hmm. uh, as this film does. Only in, those, in, that, in the case of that film, it was doing so more as a depiction of giving you real footage of things that really have happened in the world, which some of which are, as I understand it, I haven't seen the film, but as I understand it, it's, some of them are kind of akin to the kinds of things you see in this film. So. Mm -hmm. oh, so is this supposed to be a remake of the earlier one? Well, it's not really a remake. It's more of a um, fictional adaptation oh, okay. of the original film. Right, right. They've actually got a storyline as compared to the, just a documentary. Yeah, they've, they've, they've sort of drawn the story out of the content that came from that original film. Oh. Although the parallels are not exactly the same from what I understand. Again, I, I've not seen the 1963 film, so I can't give you an exact comparison. But right. from what I've read about it, uh, it, it's meant the current film is meant to be sort of an extension of what the first film was trying to do. Well, that sounds interesting for sure. Yes, definitely. All right, then uh, let's move on to the next film. Okay, so in number three in the world's going to hell in a handbasket movie, <laughs> we have a, a new documentary that was just released uh, this past week. It's airing on the HBO cable network and the HBO Max streaming service. And this is a documentary called Chernobyl, The Lost Tapes. Uh, this is a film that was made up of footage that was shot at the time of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster in 1986. The uh, Soviet government was documenting this because they wanted to depict the heroism that was being displayed by the people who were responsible for responding to this disaster. Uh, what they didn't realize is that they were compiling a record showing the results of an incident that was 
far worse than anybody was ever led to believe. Right. Uh, this film has footage of the uh, Chernobyl plant after its explosion. It covers what was done to try and clean up the mess that was left in its wake. Uh, and it also shows the impact on residents from the surrounding community, most of whom were kept in the dark about just how bad this was. They were going about their business initially as if nothing had happened, even though they were walking around in a toxic radi uh, radiation cloud that let loose an amount of fallout equivalent to 400 times the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, probably they had a false sense of security because they had been led to believe all along that there was no problem. And of course, radiation is something that you can't see, taste, smell, feel, anything like that. Right. So they weren't aware that they were being ra irradiated by what was surrounding them. The thing that's really d disturbing about this film, though, is the lengths that the Soviets went to to cover it up. Uh, not only to the local residents and to the workers at the plant, but also throughout the nation and even outside of their own country because radiation, when it escapes, knows no, knows no borders. Uh, this, the cloud of radiation was floating into Western Europe and was giving, you know, creating levels in Scandinavia 600 miles away that were far greater than you know, anybody realized. There was incidents of radioactive rain falling in the United Kingdom. And all the while, basically, the Soviets were trying to maintain a stance of um, move along, nothing to see here, don't worry, you know, this is, this is not a problem. Mm -hmm. the, uh, it's tragic in the fact of seeing what happened to some of the people who were the first responders. Uh, the film offers some rather graphic footage of what happened to the people who succumbed to radiation poisoning. So again, this is another film where viewers who are sensitive may want to consider if they want to watch it or not. Uh, the families and survivors were forced into signing non-disclosure agreements about what happened to their loved ones. And all the while that this was going on, the, the, the death toll was mounting. It was estimated ultimately to be in the neighborhood of about 200,000 people over the years, while the Soviet government officially maintained that it was a total of 31 people. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Oh, that's and, they, and, yeah, and, and, and the Russian government that has basically uh, taken over in, in its wake is still maintaining that these days. What? Even yeah. after the discovery of, of this past footage and getting to know what really happened? They're, yes, they're still maintaining that, oh, no, only 31 people died from this. Now, there's, there are some, curtain, some current parallels that are significant to recognize this in the fact that the Chernobyl plant is located in Ukraine, which was under Soviet control back in the 80s. And now, with the fall of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and Ukraine becoming an independent state, mm -hmm. the kinds of deceptive tactics that are being used to describe what's going on in the war in Ukraine by the Russian government are paralleling exactly what their Soviet predecessors did oh, when it came okay. to describing what happened with this incident back in the in 1986. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's disturbing to see that some things just haven't changed, you know, and the, the, these kinds of lies keep getting perpetuated. Uh, this is a, the kind of film that when you watch it, you'll be riveted by it, but you'll also be infuriated probably because you just wonder how people can be that inherently cruel to one another, yeah. you know, okay. um, especially when it comes to something as significant as this saying, Oh, no, it's, it's nothing to worry about. Just, you know, go your own way. But as soon as the radiation levels were detected as being, you know, just astronomically high within days of the accident, 
immediately the Soviet government was scrambling to get everybody out of town and evacuated. And, and even at that, they were telling people, oh, don't worry, this is just temporary. You'll be able to come back really soon. Oh, that's awful. Well, they've never been able to go back. You know, the radiation levels today are still incredibly high. Um, people can go in for short visits now, but it's not, you know, it's not the full-time living arrangement. Yeah. or visiting arrangement like you had back when the community was first built. So uh, this one, as I say, it, it is airing on HBO. It is HBO, and on HBO Max. Mm -hmm. uh, I recommend it heartily if you're somebody who cares about seeing something related to the dangers of nuclear power, and also to somebody who's just concerned about wanting to see the truth come out. Yeah. And it's ironic in the fact that the, the intent behind the, the filming of this footage was done for one purpose, but it's ended up becoming something entirely different. Yeah. And this film, this film makes that very, very clear. Wow, I'm, I'm just taken aback by listening to the kinds of things going on and there's the fact that they're still going on. I mean, yeah, that's really crazy. So how much would you give this film? Oh, this one gets five stars. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah this one definitely really gets five stars. Yeah. yeah. Another thing to remember with this, too, is that when, when the Fukushima incident in Japan occurred after the earthquake there, mm. that suddenly became sort of like the new poster child for uh, nuclear incidents. And Chernobyl kind of got forgotten about. You know, Fukushima was dominating the headlines as being the, the more recent and the more significant incident. But the danger that was done in Chernobyl, the damage that was done in Chernobyl was probably just as bad, if not worse. Yeah, and the effects of it are still there right now. They're still there, yeah. yes. Yeah. You know, and one of the other things I found kind of, kind of strange, too, when, when, the, when the war between the Russians and the Ukrainians first began, Chernobyl was one of the first places that the invading Russian troops took control of. And I thought to myself at the time, why would anybody want to take control? There's nobody there. And anybody who goes there is going to be putting their lives in danger by staying there anyways. Yeah. So I thought it strange that the Soviet or the Russians were making a big deal over the, you know, their claiming of this, their reclaiming of this lost territory. Mm -hmm. Do you really want that? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, um, Let's move on to the next film. This has been a lot of serious stuff. <laughs> exactly, yeah. We're, we're, we're done with gloom and doom for the day. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the next film, is on a much, much lighter note, is a British film called The Phantom of the Open. And this is a story that celebrates the underdog in all of us. It tells the story of a folk hero named Morris Flitcroft, who was a crane operator in an English uh, shipyard and was facing the possibility of losing his job because of restructuring. So he was trying to decide what he wanted to do and he was watching television one night, saw some coverage of the British Open Golf Tournament on TV and was instantly captivated and said, I want to become a professional golfer, even though he had never played a round of the game in his life. <laughs> so the film uh, follows his uh, story this is fact-based. Uh, it follows his story as he decides to pursue his career as becoming a professional golfer. And in particular, he was interested in seeing how he could find his way into playing in the British Open, which is the oldest and most one of the most prestigious golf tournaments in the, in the, in the, in the sport. He ended up rather naively and innocently writing to the authorities who were in charge of overseeing it and said, Hey, how do I, how do I, how do I get involved in this? <laughs> and they said, well, you need to fill out an application, which he did and sent in. And it was full of things that really sounded almost implausible that somebody who had really no knowledge or experience of the game would have the audacity to want to sign up for this. And the officials thought, well, if he claims he's a professional, he must be. I mean, we, you know, nobody would be this silly to try and pull off something like this. 
So they approved his application and they let him in. Mm. And when he ended up going to the tournament, he ended up recording the worst score ever tallied <laughs> in Open's history. So the people who had approved him suddenly had egg on their face, and they were trying to figure out, uh, how do we get rid of this guy? <laughs> and better yet, how do we get rid of him so he'll never be tempted to try and do this again by trying to ban him from playing golf anywhere in the United Kingdom? Mm. Unfortunately for them, he became something of a, of a folk hero. He was... Uh, warmly embraced by golf fans. He was warmly embraced by broadcasters. His performance as the world's worst golfer became very celebrated, and he developed this following that made him a local hero of sorts. So given the fact that he had this kind of reception, he said, I can't quit now. So he then began many years of campaigning to find out ways to sneak back into the open, often <laughs> under assumed names. And as, as this story goes on, it just becomes progressively more absurd that you almost think, how could any of this actually have happened? But it actually did. That was, wow. you know, it's a fact-based story. Uh, it's, it's charming. It's delightful. It's funny. Uh, it, the lead performance of Mark Rylance as the golfer is superb. Uh, there's also a very warm and sweet uh, romantic story involved here with, between him and his wife, who's played by Sally Hawkins. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, a, it's just a really nice, warm, warm, fuzzy kind of story that I think we could really use more of these days, given current conditions. Yeah. Uh, this one is playing in theaters in select cities. I'm sure it'll play more widely as time goes on and will eventually go to streaming. Uh, I recommend this one very highly. It's, it's just a nice way to spend some time at the theater and get some laughs and get some, you know, some heart, heart string tugging done. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing I like about it too, is it, it's the kind of film that you don't have to really know a lot about golf. Right. You know, it's the kind of picture where, you're really looking more at the story of an underdog who happens to be a golfer yeah. rather than doing something that's an intense, you know, golf. you know, an yeah. intense golf picture. Yeah. So, right. yeah. So, so don't let the subject matter scare you away if you're not familiar with what's going on in golf. Right. Yeah. I mean, given the fact that the main character himself doesn't know much about golf in the beginning, I think exactly. you don't need to be too concerned. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like a very fun and also a funny watch because just by hearing you describe it, I'm already laughing. So it would be great to actually watch it. Yeah, it really, it really is a lot of fun. I mean, the, um, you know, it's a little bit slow in the first hour. That's one of the things that what does work against it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, you know, there's really not much else that I can say is wrong with this picture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really a nice, a good performance by Mark Rylance. He's somebody who's really come into his own in recent years after he did his appearance in the, uh, the Steven Spielberg movie, Bridge of Spies, where he won an Oscar a number of years ago. He's gotten a lot of work since then, and he's, he's always consistently good. He's definitely a character actor. Uh, somebody who you know you won't forget once you see him give one of his performances, and he does that again here. So it's 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 very enjoyable. That's great. So what will be your rating for this? I would give this one four to four and a half stars. Ah, uh, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. So to uh, to round out the last of our new movies, uh, the final the final picture is the film biography of the king of rock and roll, Elvis. And this was a movie that I had a kind of wonder going in, asking myself, given how many times Elvis' story has been told in movies and television, do we really need another one? Right. You know, but there are things that sort of set this movie apart from many of the other predecessors about Elvis. It gets into some of the things that are a little bit lesser known, such as his interest in social justice concerns, uh, his uh, efforts to promote the 
music and artistry of black musicians, which is really what inspired him to get into the music business in the first place. Um, and also his relationship with his manager, Colonel Tom Parker, who is played by Tom Hanks. Uh, he, Elvis sort of put an implicit trust in, in Colonel Parker, and he didn't always look after Elvis's best interests as well as he could have. Uh, so you have this sort of dynamic of the, uh, the artist sort of being manipulated into doing mm -hmm. things that maybe he did or didn't want to do, uh, some things that he did want to do that he didn't get to do. And, um, you know, it's, it's um, sort of a rise and fall film of, of a character where you see Elvis beginning from, you know, rather humble roots to becoming this megastar who eventually ended up kind of self-destructing in some ways yeah. and who also, again, you know, fell under the influence of this uh, Svengali-esque manager who didn't always take care of him as well as he could or should have. Right. The, uh, one, it, it's, the film is uh, the latest film from director Baz Luhrmann, who's from Australia, and he's probably best known for the remake of The Great Gatsby that came out back you know, about seven or eight years ago, I believe now. It's very much cut from the same cloth as The Great Gatsby in terms of being very glitzy, very stylish, uh, a lot of emphasis placed on the production values, the costumes, uh, the editing. Uh, it's, it's really very dazzling to the eye to watch. Right. And it manages to hold uh, viewer interest fairly well, given the fact that this is a two hour and 40 minute film. Wow. That's hard to do, you know, yeah. but, but the director does a pretty good job of that here. It sags a little bit in the middle, but for the most part, this is pretty consistently uh, attention grabbing. Uh, the um, musical numbers are all very well done. But for me, the, the biggest asset of this film is the actor who plays Elvis. He's uh, a relatively unknown performer named Austin Butler. He's made a number of a number of other part movies and played a number of different parts, but he's never had uh, a showcase for his talent like he does here. Oh. And he runs with it perfectly. Yeah. He does a great job of portraying Elvis sincerely, uh, reverentially. And that's important because Elvis is also somebody who is a very distinct persona that if left in lesser hands, could easily be turned into a cartoon. I mean, right? You know, there there are so many there are so many cliches about him. Particularly when Elvis got older and he put on weight, uh, he ended up struggling through his performances, many times mumbling his way through his songs. You don't really see a lot of that here. You see him portraying Elvis as talented artist, somebody who fell under some unfortunate circumstances, but he's not mocked. He's not uh, lampooned or anything like that. Uh, he, he is delivered very sincerely and reverentially. And I, I appreciated that about the film because it could have been very easy to slip into all that other stuff and, you know, become just rather insincere and disrespectful. Right. So uh, if you're a, a rock and roll fan, especially of old time rock and roll, mm -hmm. I think you'll really appreciate this. You'll see where he got his starts, where he got his roots from. Uh, you have characters who portray other artists who were popular at the time, like B.B. King, and uh, Little Richard, mm -hmm. Fats Domino, and you know they're all they're all presented in a way where Elvis pays tribute to them for what they did for music and what they did for helping him to get his career started. Right. So 
Uh, this is a this is a good solid film. Uh, it's not uh, something that has a whole lot of new revelations or new insights into Elvis, but it does a pretty good job of telling his biography uh, solidly and without any attempt to try and uh, play games along the way. Right. So do you think they did a good job, like, making this new film on Elvis, given all the films that are already there? Like, do you think it was worth the watch? Yeah, I think they did. I mean, you know, it, I, I think this movie, to a certain degree, aspires to be more epic than okay. it really is. Right. Um, but it's still very solid in all the areas that really count. The performances, the uh, costuming, production design, uh, special effects, mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. Uh, and also in terms of really trying to play it straight in terms of giving you, you know, a truthful and authentic presentation of his life and career. Right. So how much would you rate this one? I would give this one three and a half stars. Okay. And I would recommend that if you do want to see it, see it on a big screen because it, it really is the kind of picture that deserves to be shown so that you can really appreciate the, the stylishness and the uh, larger than life quality that's right. brought to bear in the way this story is told. Yeah, it sounds cinematic, it does. And it is playing in theaters right now. So, okay. you know, if you have a chance to go see it, now's your time. So now we come to something new. This is the first annual. <laughs> Frankie Sense and More, LGBTQIA Film Festival Great. In, honor of, in honor of Pride Month. By the way, for those of you out there who uh, are unfamiliar with what this ever-expanding acronym stands for, it's just added a couple of letters this, this year. It stands for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer, Intersexual, Asexual. So... It's covering the whole gambit. It's getting a little long and cumbersome. Some people have suggested they should just rename it the alphabet people. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a, a, our, first, our first attempt at doing something like this. And even though it's at the, almost at the end of Pride Month, uh, there are a number of films that are worth watching. And they don't have to be watched during Pride Month, but we'll give it a shot to let you know what's out there and uh, things you can take a look at. Right. Uh, our first movie is a film that's uh, from, it's a French-Belgian co-production called Lola. And one of the things I really like about this film is the fact that it's a story that is in many ways universal for many people. It just happens to have a transgender character at the center of it. Uh, unlike a lot of other gay cinema, which has always focused very heavily on gay themed issues specifically, this deals more with everyday human people themes that just happen to have a gay a transgender character involved in the story. Mm -hmm. So basically Lola tells the story of a transgender female who is going through the process of um, becoming a, a woman, even though she has not had the final surgery as yet. Uh, her father is very distraught with the idea that she has done this, uh, but her mother has been very supportive taking her to doctor's appointments and counseling and so forth. Unfortunately, her mother passes away and her support network essentially disappears in many ways, at least within her family. Yeah. Uh, her father is so upset with the decision that she's made that he even goes out of his way to purposely deceive his own child about the funeral for her mother. She shows up at what she thinks is going to be the funeral, and it's already done. Oh, my God. Uh, needless to say, she's furious about this, yeah. uh, that she didn't get to say a proper goodbye. But then she finds out that actually there's one more task to be done. And that was her mother's request 
that her ashes be scattered at the Belgian she seashore where she grew up. And at that point, she basically muscles her way into accompanying her father to complete this task. So they embark on a road trip for the seacoast. Uh, it starts out very tense, but as it progresses, you end up seeing a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions come out, and there is something of a warming that begins to develop between the two of them, leading to the possibility of forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, that's the kind of story that is something that a lot of parents and children who end up becoming estranged from, other, from one another go through. Uh, you don't have to be in circumstances like what Lowell is facing in order for that to be the case. It just happens that that's, you know, an element that's added to this storyline that has been played out in many other kinds of movie vehicles over the years. And I'm glad to see that because it's, it's showing how uh, gay cinema and LGBTQ TIA cinema is growing and stretching. And I really salute the effort that they've done with this film. It's, it's really very touching. Uh, it's, Kind of hard to watch at times because you see some very raw emotions coming out amongst the characters. But, you know, sometimes that's what it takes to get to reconciliation and to overcome these kinds of obstacles that can get in the way in terms of personal relationships. I really like this movie a lot. Now, the unfortunate part about this is that while viewers in Canada and Europe have ready access to stream this one. In the US, at least for now, your best bet is trying to catch it at a film festival. As far as I know, there is no official US distributor for this film, mm -hmm. at least as yet. It's not to say that there won't be at some point. Mm -hmm. um, COVID has wreaked havoc with movie distribution schedules. And there are movies that were made as much as several years ago that are now just getting released in the theaters and on and streaming. Mm -hmm. uh, and it could very well be that maybe, you know, Lola might be caught up in that particular, that particular issue. Yeah. I really do hope that it does get a U.S. distributor because this is a fine film and it's one that I would give four stars. Wow. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's move on to the next film we have. Okay, so the next film is a documentary uh, called Gamal and Tim. And this tells the story of the mysterious deaths of two young black gay men uh, at the home of a well-connected Democratic Party fundraiser named Ed Buck, who lived in West Hollywood. Uh, the film explores what actually went down in this mysterious story and also the apparent attempts by officials to kind of downplay the role that uh, Ed Buck may have played in this story. Uh, the fact that he is almost being shielded by officials to protect his reputation and to try and downplay uh, whatever happened in his home. The film definitely does a good job of showing the emotion that his friends, family, and survivors experienced in the wake of their deaths. It plays a little bit, um, I don't want to say fast and loose, but it, it, it definitely doesn't seem to be as solid in its presentation of the legal aspects involved in this mm -hmm. uh, as it does with the emotional aspects. So I have to kind of hedge my bets a little bit about that, about this film and that aspect. Um, but it is still something that is worth seeing, mainly because it's unfortunate to see that these kinds of things still happen. It's yeah. something that, you know, I think a lot of us in the community would like to have hoped that we're getting past these kinds of issues, we're getting beyond them, but they're still there. And this film serves as a significant reminder of that. So it's uh, something that I would give uh, about three and a half stars to. Mm -hmm. 
at this point. Yeah. Probably the best bet for viewers to see this again is at either film festivals or special screenings. To my knowledge, it doesn't have an official distributor as yet. Okay. Again, that might change. It's only been out since last year. And again, with the, the COVID impact on distribution schedules, uh, it may be just caught in the pipeline for now. So. All right. All right. Well, uh, moving on then. Okay, so the next three films are all movies that have been discussed on Frankie Sense and More at different times in the past. And my main reason for talking about them now is, in addition to them being good movies, uh, I have updates about all of them. Uh, the first one is a Canadian film called Jump Darling, which tells the story of a rather unsuccessful gay actor who ends up pursuing uh, a career as a drag queen to try and get things going. But unfortunately, he's not having quite the success or satisfaction from that that he thought he would have. He's also experiencing issues with his partner, and he finally decides that he's had enough, he needs to get away. So he ends up leaving his home in Toronto and going to visit his grandmother, played by Cloris Leachman, in her final screen performance at her rural home in uh, uh, Ontario, uh, in Ontario farm country. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a very touching intergenerational film where you see the dynamics and love of a family member stepping in to help somebody who is going through a crisis of his own. Yeah. Even though she is also going through a crisis of her own given her age and declining health condition. Uh, one of the things that's really most significant about this film, though, as I say, is, is the performance of Cloris Leachman. This was her final screen performance, and she just knocks it out of the park. She's just terrific in this role. Uh, personally, I thought it was something that might have even been awards-worthy consideration, but it, that didn't happen. But at the very least, I'm glad to see that this film is now available for streaming and it's also available on home media. So even though when I first talked about this a number of months ago, it was only uh, available in Canada and was not available in the US, uh, now you can get to see it and it's definitely worth doing. Uh, this is one movie that I would give four stars to. Wow, that's pretty good, yeah. Now, the same story about uh, availability in the U.S. now also applies to our next film, which is called Down in Paris, which is a French film that tells the story of a filmmaker who is have, struggling with getting his latest movie produced. He's got issues involving his personal life. He's got issues involving his artistry. And he also has some issues involving matters of a spiritual or metaphysical standpoint. He ends up exploring all of them by spending a night walking around Paris trying to gain perspective. And he ends up coming to a number of revelations and insights that he didn't have previously. And it ends up putting him back on the path to getting his work back on track. This is a, uh, a surprisingly deep film that delves into areas, again, that gay cinema typically does not do very often. Uh, so I, I recommend it on the standpoint that it's another film that represents growth in the genre in terms of the kind of material that LGBTQIA cinema is willing to cover. Uh, this one, again, when we first talked about it, was uh, not available in the U.S. other than film festivals, but it now, too, is available for streaming and on home media, and it gets four stars as well. That's great. And our third film in this regard is something we actually just talked about on the last show. Mm -hmm. It's the documentary Mama Bears. Yeah. And the update here is that in addition to playing at film festivals, this is now also playing in special screenings. I'm sure part of that has been spurred on by this being Pride Month, but I'm hoping that it doesn't end here. I'm hoping that the special screenings for this film continue. Uh, this film tells the story of 
a group of fundamentalist Christian mothers who have gay children or trans children and refused to give up their connections with them just because their religious leaders told them they had to. They subsequently got together and formed an organization known as the Mama Bears, who is working hard to be a support network and to further the causes of their gay and trans children. This is a very warm, touching film in so many ways. I really enjoyed it when I saw it at the Milwaukee Film Festival last month. Mm -hmm. And this one, uh, as I say, look for uh, a screening schedule on the film's website to see where it's going to be playing. It gets five stars. I remember this one, and I, I remember you really enjoyed it as well. It sounded like a wonderful watch. I really did. I mean, you know, every year when I had attended the Gay Pride Parade here in Chicago, when all the different contingencies would, you know, come down the street on their floats and their marching groups and so forth, mm -hmm. the contingent that has consistently always received the most applause is a forerunner group of the Mama Bears called PFLAG, which stands for Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. It's so touching to see people who you wouldn't necessarily always think would be in your corner coming out and offering that kind of support. Right. And Mama Bears is now kind of an extension of that, uh, specifically coming from a segment of society that has traditionally be, been even more reluctant to want to offer its encouragement and support and to see them getting out there and doing this, I just have to really applaud their efforts. And I'm really glad to see this film is out there to draw attention to, the, to, to this group and what they're doing. Right, yeah. Now these first five movies are all movies that I definitely recommend that people see. Now we come to one that I would say avoid at all costs. <laughs> Uh, this is a film that was an original film made for the Hulu streaming network called Fire Island. Uh, this film is about a group of friends who go on vacation on Fire Island, which is a uh, predominantly gay resort uh, off the coast of Long Island. And it's dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really had to fight the temptation of turning it off while I was watching it. Uh, one of the things that really bothered me about this film is that it's something that aspires to try and bust a lot of gay stereotypes, particularly gay male stereotypes, and yet it turns right around and essentially perpetuates them with the way these characters are written and the story is told. Uh, it's shallow, it's cloying, it's just annoying on every front. And I'm, I've been very surprised that it's gotten a warm, as warm a reception as it has. Um, personally, I, I really just was very disappointed by this. I think it could have done a lot more. Mm -hmm. It's very loosely based on the Jane Austen story, Pride and Prejudice. Oh. And in that regard, I suppose I could give it a modicum of support in the fact that, again, it's trying to do something more. Yeah. But that aspect of the film is really overshadowed by all the things with it that I found just drastically wrong. So I, I would say, I mean, if, if, watch it at your peril if you want, but I really would not recommend it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what earned it a rare rating of one star. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah, that is very rare. I don't think I recall you giving like one star to. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, one of the things I try to do with the movie reviews I do on here is, is give people things, uh, give them recommendations for things I think they really Did. would like to see, they yeah. should see, that offer, <clears throat> excuse me, enlightenment and information, um, inspiration in line with the, the theme of movies with meaning as, as we talk about on here. Yeah. Um, but I'm also not opposed to lowering the hammer when I have to. <laughs> and, 
and and this is a case unfortunately where i i really feel i've had to do it so right so one movie that i would recommend in place of fire island is a film that has much of its activity set on fire island and that's the 1986 classic gay film parting glances uh this film was directed by a filmmaker named Bill Sherwood. It's the only movie he ever made. Uh, he died of AIDS at age 37, and he never had a chance to create any further works, but he certainly made a terrific film in parting glances. It tells the story of an upscale New York gay couple who were going through some difficulties uh, and are looking to have some time apart from one another. Uh, part of the reason of that is the, uh, one of their friends is himself dying of AIDS, and one of the, and one of the partners is having trouble dealing with that. Uh, he reminisces frequently in the film about their days vacationing on Fire Island and the good times they shared together. And it's, the, um, it's a very warm touching heartfelt film that is got a lot of great humor in it it's got a lot of very heartfelt moments in it uh it's the film that essentially made actor steve buscemi a star he really this really kind of put him on the map mm -hmm. um the film has held up very well over the years in some ways it's also kind of a time capsule reminding the gay community of a very different time in our history when, I mean, if you thought COVID was scary, try being a gay person in the midst of the onset of the AIDS crisis. It was absolutely terrifying. Right. And this film helps to, helps to show that. And in many ways, very realistically, because it was actually unfolding at the time. Right. And also the fact that the, that the director was himself suffering from the illness. Uh, this is uh, a film that is available on home media, and it's also available, I believe, on the Tubi uh, streaming service for free. So it's something that's it's readily accessible, even though it was made a number of years ago and is a little bit on the obscure side. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a great film, recommended highly. Uh, I would give it four and a half stars. Wow. That's great. It sounds like a great film. It is a really good film. Yeah. I definitely, I definitely recommend it highly. So there you have it, folks. That's our first LGBTQ, LGBTQIA film festival. Great. Hopefully Thank we'll have, you, Brent. <laughs> hopefully well, we'll, this, we'll yeah. have it again next year, and uh, yeah. maybe we can have a fanfare to include with the flag. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. This is great. Um, I think that wraps up our show for today. Yeah, we uh, will be back again next month with some more films. There's a few summer, a few more summer blockbusters coming out, mm -hmm. such as the movie Thor Love and Thunder, the latest in the Marvel Studios series. Yeah. And uh, Nope, the latest film from uh, Jordan Peele the creator of the films uh, Get Out and, and Us, and also the release of the uh, a Spanish film that's called Official Competition, which is a takeoff and satire on film festivals. Wow. <laughs> so there's, there's some good stuff coming along. Yeah, great. We're looking forward to it then. And uh, thank you everybody for listening. Thanks, Brent. We'll see Thank you next you. month. Take care, everybody.